Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for taking a little bit of time out of your day to join me here as I do a little bit of live cartography. I uh, hope you're having some good time where you're at. It's real unseasonably warm, we'll say, here in Wisconsin. Something like 70 degrees Fahrenheit today, which is more like June weather. So I've been taking advantage of uh, of that in the last few week, uh, last few days, getting outside. But today I'm going to stay inside and make a map instead. Uh, what was I going to say? See, I thought of some things I was going to say at the start, and now I don't remember what they are. Well, that's all right. Um, so today um, I'm going to be making a map that is related to the 30-day mapping challenge. So let me just bring this over here for a second for you to see. Uh, or 30-day map challenge. And uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's this sort of uh, semi-organized effort to just get people to make a bunch of maps uh, on specific, sort of around specific keywords or themes and every day in November. I think this is the uh, third year or so that it's been going around uh, and I have uh, not participated before, so this is my first year. And uh, I, you know, previously, earlier this month, I took day five, November 5th, blue, and I reposted a map that was blue that I already made in the past. Uh, but for today, November 9th, the theme is monochrome. And I decided I was going to make my own map from scratch for that sort of thing. Uh, I should mention this 30 day map challenge is organized by this person. Uh, Topi Chukhanov, and I'm definitely not saying that name correctly, uh, but uh, Topi's page is worth checking out on GitHub. Definitely, uh, there's some interesting stuff there, especially if you use, for example, QGIS. Uh, all kinds of fun QGIS styles that Topi has put together that you can import right in there and get some cool stuff going on there. Uh, Topi does a lot of cool, interesting work. Definitely worth checking out. Hello, Ibrahim. Thanks for joining, and thank you for the, the compliment on the beard. I have not shaved or cut my hair since May, I think May. So, yeah, so what is that? That's almost, coming up in, on about six months now. Um, just, just seeing what's going to happen. I've been told I look like a druid. I've been told I look like a Latin American revolutionary. I've had all kinds of uh, interesting uh, reactions to it. It's only really the second time in my life that I've had any sort of extensive facial hair. So that's kind of fun, although I constantly feel like I've got something on my face. So we'll see how much longer this lasts, but it's an experiment for now. So. I'm going to be participating today in the 30-day mapping challenge, Monochrome, and if you don't know anything about me, probably the most important thing to understand about me and my cartography is that I love monochrome things. Uh, it is probably my favorite way to do cartography, and uh, I ran a uh, monochrome mapping competition uh, last year that uh, Toby was kind enough to link to as part of the... Uh, the 30-day map challenge list uh, called Monocardo, uh, which I had all kinds of people just submit cool monochrome maps, and you can kind of page through them if you look for Monocardo 2019. Some are hand-drawn, some are animated, different colors, uh, but a lot of cool stuff there. I'm I'm a big fan of monochrome, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, one thing to note is that I've cheated a little bit. I did some. Uh, I did some ahead work on this thing, uh, which is probably what you'll see in the, the thumbnail to this. Uh, we're going to get into what all this is in a little bit, but I have already played around with some styles. I think I kind of know where I want to go and whether or not this idea is going to is gonna work out in the way that I hope. So um, it's not going to be, it's sort of partly live, but it's live following down a, a specific track. And uh, I'm going to make it even harder on myself, not just doing monochrome, but I'm going to do like just black or just white, not even any shades of gray in between. Because, you know, if you look at a lot of these great maps, they're, you know, they've got a light and a dark color, and they have all the all the gradations of color that exist between, which really helps uh, you get a lot of stuff done. But I... I'm just going to do solid black and solid white, and I've, I've played around with this a little bit before. So um, 
if you uh, if I look at my portfolio here, I made an atlas late last year. Actually, I started working on it probably about this time last year. Uh, that is entirely made from just one color of ink. In this case, uh, it's, uh, these are printed with the cyanotype process, uh, which won't get into too much, but let me see if I can just go to the blog post and get you some better photos of it. All of these maps, you know, they just have solid colors. There's no, there's blue and there's white. There's no in between. And this kind of started with me challenging myself to see how much stuff can I cram in? Like how, how much detail in a map can I show if I really only have solid fills of black and nothing else? And that's an idea that, you know, I really like doing things that challenge me in this way is what I'm coming to realize as a part of my theme. Like I've done done maps on typewriters too, for example, where you're just really, that's a little slow there, where you're just really limited in um, how you can express yourself cartographically. So that's kind of what I want to play around with uh, as part of my monochrome map today. Uh, and you'll see these symbols here that I've been testing. This isn't really the map, it's just some, some examples that I was working on a few days ago to see if this would work. Uh, they look like trees. And that's going to tie into another part about me. I like making things with these limitations and I like working on monochrome and challenging myself. I also really like climbing trees. It's a hobby of mine. I was just out climbing some trees yesterday because the weather was really nice. So being up in a tree is kind of my happy place. And I, um, I've decided to map some details about where I've been climbing trees in my city lately. And I've actually mapped this once before, uh, but that was a little bit older. Um, now I've got some, uh, um, can you go back to my, oh, up here. I, I have shown this map once or twice before, but um, right here, so I made a map in a different style previously about uh, some of the trees that I had climbed in my neighborhood in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, last year, but I've climbed a lot more since then, especially because with the pandemic, you need to find more things to do that are, don't involve other people, and it turns out it's really good social distancing if you're 30 feet up in a tree. You're away from everybody. It's great. Um, I feel like it's a good, uh, it's good introvert's exercise. Uh, Atlas is glad to see me online at random. Well, thanks for, thanks for joining. I appreciate anybody who's, uh, who's taking the time to be here because I know it's Monday and, you know, it's sort of for a lot of people, depending on your time zone, you might have other things you have to be doing. Uh, I work for myself, so I'm pretty flexible about things. Uh, or it's Monday for me, and I don't know if any of you are on the other side of the international dateline, and it might be uh, might be Tuesday for you. Um, all right, so let me, let me just pull up here um, my tree data. Oh, yes, so the other thing. Uh, when I climb trees, where do the data for this map of my tree climbs come from? Well, uh, every time I climb a tree, I take notes of where that tree was and what I give the rating that I give to it, as well as some comments and sometimes the height that I've uh, been up in that tree uh, in feet. Uh, and I do this partly because um, I want to be able to go back to trees more easily, so I literally have... Um, let me pull up on my phone here. Maybe I can show you if I can get the data to load. Yeah, so I'm going to go like real close up. Oh, get live my camera. There's little dots on Google Maps for where the trees are. So this way, like if I'm out and about, I know where my trees are at that, or whether I've climbed a certain one before, whether it's any good, because I'm not going to remember what all the trees look like. Uh, so I remember where they, I write down where they are, and then I give them a rating on a weird uh, four-level system in which the lowest level is unremarkable, and then the next level up is sufficient, then third is worthwhile, and then fourth is quality, high-quality tree that I really want to go back to. Uh, and so that's kind of my ranking scale, and it's very subjective. And, you know, I'll, I'll leave notes explaining sometimes to myself why, although I pretty much never read those notes ever again. I just feel like I should take notes, I don't know, in case somebody ever wants to 
in case somebody ever wants to climb trees in the Madison, Wisconsin area, I guess they'll they'll have some data for that. So I've got this nice spreadsheet here of 82 trees. Uh, as of yesterday, I added two more that I've climbed in the past while. So I'm just going to download a little CSV here. And I am going to go into QGIS. And I'm just going to add in that, uh, that climb documentation information. And we'll pull these lat long coordinates. And just to give us a little sense of where we're at, I'm going to throw in an open street map, base map, kind of see where we're looking at, what part of the world we're looking at. So I have climbed a couple of trees down in the Chicago area last year and a couple out here in uh, rural Wisconsin. I was at a music festival out there last summer and it sort of takes place in a nice rural area and there's trees around so sometimes I'd wander off and climb but almost all of them are in the Madison area. So first off I'm gonna project this whole thing into um, that's the geographic reference system. Um, I just need to get uh, my Dane County coordinate system, this giant window here. Let me scale this down. I'm just changing this into, uh, I just reprojected this into something more appropriate to my area. Um, fortunately, this is, I think this is unusual for the United States, but while uh, in Wisconsin, every county has its own coordinate reference system. And they're all in QGIS, so I uh, already had this up from before, but literally I could look for Dane, because I live in Dane County, Wisconsin. And there's a Lambert Conformal Conic already set for Dane County, Wisconsin. So, real simple. Um, and I, I don't know why exactly all the counties in Wisconsin have these, whereas in a lot of other states that's not true. You know, Wisconsin has a does have a long tradition of, like, um, of interchange of ideas between um, cartographers and GIS specialists and the state government. We have a state cartographer, for example, so I think that might be one of the driving forces behind this sort of spatial thinking even at the, you know, to give every county its own carefully tuned reference system. Um, all right, so I'm just going to take a look here, make sure my data look good. Everything came in all right. So let me go back to Illustrator for a second and explain my idea. And it's a little, it's a little ill-conceived. I think it's one of those symbology ideas that's more complex than I would normally like to do for a reader, but it's kind of fun to make. And since nobody is really going to use this map, it's just a for fun thing. I'm going to give it a try. My idea that I tested out here on the screen is that I plan on binning all of these tree locations into hexagons, into, into a grid. And then within each hexagon, I'm going to symbolize how many trees fall within each of these rating categories, like how many really great trees are there and how many not so great trees are there that I climbed. And I'm partly thinking about doing binning because you know, there's a lot of these clusters here. And so it's it would be really hard to sort of separate all this information in a clear way otherwise. So if I just instead drop some sort of hexagon grid over everything and just look at count the number of trees in each grid cell and symbolize that instead of each individual tree, that'll clean the data up a little bit, I think is going to be the, the way to do it. Uh, and the way that I, I've got this little tree symbol that I've already got drawn, I pulled it from another Illustrator document. It was uh, the same Illustrator document that I pulled, that I that I made for uh, this thing here, for these maps of the trees that I climbed before. So might as well reuse it. It's kind of inspired a little bit by, you know, uh, 1920s, 1930s isotype style cartography. That was the general idea behind this specific style of map. But I'm just going to repurpose that symbol because I think it works out pretty well. For my convenience, I'm going to ignore all the trees that aren't in Madison, and I think I'm going to ignore all the trees that aren't in just this part of the city, on the central east side, which is where I live. I mostly have climbed things that are easy to get to. Uh, 
And so that's kind of the area that we're going to be mapping. So let me just close this out a little bit. So the first thing we need is a grid. And so let's just go to research tools and create a grid. And bring this in. All of my all of my windows are popping up in um, slightly inconvenient locations for my, my stream because I'm actually streaming the top left quadrant of my monitor right now. So I have all kinds of stuff off screen here and there, like the chat window so I can see what you say. And feel free to, to ask questions or anything like that or say hi. It's it's nice to have you all here. But if anything I do you're know, curious about, want to know more about, or want to just talk about what you do in the same situation, if you do it differently than me, please do chime in. Always, always good to learn some extra things here. Uh, so I'm going to create a, a hexagon grid, and I'm going to try. Hmm. You know, I don't have a really good sense, actually. Let's figure out how big should these things be. I'm just going to do a little quick measurement here and get a sense of, you know, that's 200 meters would be that big. All right, I'm going to try. Yeah, I'm going to try like a 200 meter and see how that looks. 200 meters, 200 meters, and let's make the grid extent the map canvas extent. And I'm just going to remove the remove the fill here and make this red for a second, just so I can see it easily and get a sense of how these are going to be distributed. You know, I think that. I think that could look pretty good. I think that's a decent size. It's one of those things where after I finish making the map, I may go, uh, you know, I want to change the size and then start over. But hopefully I won't lead myself quite into that kind of situation. OK, so I'm going to, the way that I, I did this during my test was to do separate spatial joins to, I, what I need to do is I need to count the number of each sort of quality of tree in each cell. You know, how many high quality trees are there in this cell? How many low quality trees? I need some separate numbers for each of those. So I'm gonna do some separate, like separate spatial joins for each one. So if I open this up here and look at my ratings. Oh, I've also got, uh, there's a, extra rating for trees that I climbed for forage. That's where I like, I, there are some apple trees and some berry trees in my neighborhood that are public. And so sometimes I'm not climbing the tree for fun. Sometimes I'm climbing it because I'm trying to get fruit from it. Uh, so that's what that note is about. So we're not going to count those. So let's grab all of the quality trees. Oh, that's the highest rating. I've just got those selected. And I go to search join, join attributes by location summary. And I'm going to take my grid and join to my layer, climb, take all of my selected features. And fields to summarize. It doesn't really matter what field I pick. I don't know if I have to pick a field if I just want the count, but I'm going to do one anyway because I really just want the count of everything that gets joined. Uh, and again, I'm no, I'm no QGIS expert, so um, definitely if you find better ways that I should be doing all these things, uh, please let me know. But with my joined layer, this number should tell me how many high quality trees, three in each of those cells, one in each of those cells. Great. Uh, and just so that I remember what that thing is called, I'm going to call this quality. Just create a new field that copies over the tree ID count. And I can get rid of that. Great. Uh, all right. Also, let me move this out of the way in the background here because it's also got my streaming information I can check on my stream quality off to the side here. Looks like it says my connection is still excellent. Great. Wonderful. And there's there was or are 22 of you out here. So that's great. 
That's a lot more than I expected for a random Monday, so thanks so much. I also wonder how much the, uh, you know, the fact that we all are spending so much time watching people live on the internet nowadays during the pandemic, I don't know how that's affected things, because I feel like last year fewer people showed up, because I think it just wasn't as much part of the, the way that so many people interacted online anymore. I have certainly gotten more comfortable seeing my face on camera, even though it's still not super easy. I'm not looking at my video feed right now, so I can't see what I look like. All right, so we got that one. John Nelson. John Nelson says, hey, Daniel, John Nelson, aren't you supposed to be working right now? Don't you have something to do better than following me on, on the internet? Thanks for being here, buddy. All right, now I'm just going to go and do this again for the next thing, next layer. Brandon, thanks so much for being here. I'm sorry you missed the last one, but, um, you know, they're all they're all on my YouTube page. And, in fact, they're, you know, this video will exist at this exact same link forever or until YouTube stops existing. So that's the nice thing about this. And if you... Uh, if you go to my website, if you're ever curious about any of my old stuff, somethingaboutmaps.com, just go to YouTube, takes you right to my channel, where it says I'm doing a live video right now. But, you know, I've got a playlist for my live Cardo series, my old Nasus presentations, all this sort of things. So, uh, yeah, feel free to, if you missed anything in the past, check in on there. You can watch me label video, label maps and everything. All kinds of things that I wasn't really wasn't really sure if people would want to see, but it turns out at least a few people are map nerds enough to want to do that. All right, so we got all the quality trees. Uh, next, I'm going to take the the two lowest rankings, sufficient and unremarkable, and I'm going to combine them together because if we look at the symbology I was playing with before, you know, when you're when you're in this very harsh monochrome, there's not even grayscale in between. Um, we don't have, you know, we want to simplify our data as much as possible. So my goal is for each hex cell, say like here's the quality trees and the size of that symbol is the number of those. The low quality trees are going to be the black with the uh, white outline and then there's going to be some sort of stripe or maybe a half pattern in between. And I don't want to make a lot of gradations in between. You know, I could try doing four trees, but it doesn't play as well with the shape of the hex. So I'm just, I want to simplify things when I have such a limited space to work with and such a limited palette. So instead I'm taking the, the worst rating of tree and we're just going to select all those and, and lump them together. So I'm just going to join again my joined layer this time. Selected features, get my, get my count, and run it once more. All right, now we've got the lower quality trees. Oops, unremarkable. And if I'd, you know, been planning more from in advance, I would have maybe come up with a different rating system than the one I eventually landed on. But this is what I got. I've also been thinking about rating the, uh, that's the overall fun of climbing the tree. It's not necessarily how hard it is and I have been thinking about a, a rating system for that, which um, uses terms potentially like, where's my list of those? Uh, bracing, strenuous, trivial, or typical. So again, words which don't necessarily help people. I guess it depends on who you are that you consider this tree to be bracing or typical. But again, it's probably just me who's going to climb these things. All right, so one more to, one more layer to join. Let's pull our data on the worthwhile, the second highest ranking. I do one more join, and then we'll have a grid that's got all that information in there that we need. So join, so we can get a count. Actually, if I don't specify one, can I still just get a count? Does that work? It just counted all of them. All right, interesting, because I didn't specify a field, so it did every field, and I just did the count of the number of joints. 
Oh, that's interesting. So I've learned something about QGIS today. All right, worthwhile. And I'll just bring one of them over. Get rid of all the fields I don't need anymore. All right, for each cell, we now know for each of the three, each of the, uh, wait a minute, did one of my pieces of the data go missing? Hmm. My spot check suggests, because I see now there's only one cell that has quality. Whereas before, hmm, some of my data went missing because I remember before I had, I had more than that. What happened? I don't know. It is a GIS mystery. Well, I guess you get to watch me do it again. So that's fun. All right, well, take my selected, oh, no, join features. I have documentation. I still have the worthwhile one selected. This is why I always spot check. You'll find some weird thing about your data that, or something went wrong. And now I'm also getting some different numbers here. Because I remember that was nine before, but I do have just the worthwhile one selected. So, okay. All right, well, that looks correct this time. Thing, don't trust computers. Never trust a computer, they won't do it right. Oh, uh, maybe it was, maybe I accidentally had like selected features or something like that. Only update selected features, is that what I did wrong? That could be, sometimes I accidentally select that. Worthwhile. Let's take our sum. All right, those numbers match. Great, and if I get rid of these other ones, there's a lot of nulls because there's places where there weren't any trees, and that's fine. Okay. And I got two of these layers. Which one is the correct one? The brown one. Let's get rid of the old one. Okay. Try this again. Select the quality trees and join that to the Selected Climb documentation. Count. Yeah. This has got to be real exciting content I'm generating right now. Watch somebody click through QGIS. But yeah, now there's, now there's all those cells that have higher quality trees. I don't know where they went before. They're there, and the worthwhile ones still are there and topping out at five. I must have just been careless and click something wrong because, as I'm always reminded, computers only do what you tell them to, so it's your fault. <laughs> or at least that's what they that's what they tell me in high school. Although I'm not the one who programmed QGIS, so I think part of it could be their fault. All right, last one, right? Last one. Just give me that, an account. All right, and these are the lower quality ones. These are still there, those are still there. Good, good. Numbers didn't go away this time. Unremarkable trees. And delete that field I don't really need anymore. All right, they're all there now. Very good, so each cell has a maximum of five trees in each category. Okay, so, very good. So now, I need to do, 
And there are a couple of things I'm going to need to do. Um, I'm going to need to bring out this grid into Illustrator, and I'm also going to want to know, I think, um, where the water is. Because I'm going to cut away like I did my test. I didn't actually use any real water data, I just deleted some cells to show like, oh, I'm going to sort of cut away the water. That helps define uh, a Madison kind of boundary for those who are familiar with the city. We're between, primarily between a couple of lakes here. It's mostly, most of Madison is on an isthmus, which is a fun and hard word to say that they taught me in geography class in, uh, in middle school, I want to say. So I'm going to need some water data. Uh, and there is a really handy tool I've been using actually a fair bit lately um, called Quick OSM. It's a plugin. So if you go to uh, plugins, plugin console, or not plugin console, um, manage and install plugins. If you use QGIS, you can uh, pull up the, the Quick OSM one that I've got there. I actually learned about this specifically through a recent article in uh, Cartographic Perspectives which is a the journal of NASIS, which is my professional society, North American Cartographic Information Society. Cartographic Perspectives is our journal. And I, uh, I'm i the assistant editor, so I actually I copy edit the articles and lay them out, so I get paid to read the journal. And in, I think it was our most recent issue, number 95, yeah, in number 95 there was this article evaluating methods for downloading open street map data and you can this journal is completely free and so i learned about quick osm and how it works in there so definitely uh check out cartographic perspectives which is at cartographicperspectives.org uh ibrahim asks me how do i decide on my map idea and aesthetics um i'm choosing due to hexagons so uh, you know, I puzzled over this map a little bit before. Like I said, this was uh, you know, over the weekend, I think. I, no, it was a little bit. It might have been Friday. I started thinking about, you know, I wanted to do a monochrome map for this day of the competition because I love doing monochrome stuff. And I was nearing the end of the tree climbing season, and I thought it was nice to look back on, on the trees. And I started to think about, like, how do I... how do I really aggregate this data together? And I tried to think about ways to visualize it. Like, I thought about... What if I had different size circles for the different tree qualities? Um, which I could, you know, I could do that right now, actually. Let's see how that looks. Uh, tree rating, classify, turn off the forage ones, and just make like, I don't know, let's just do a real quick classification here, like make those big, those ones will be small, those ones will be small, these ones will be like medium size. Right, maybe doing some with like dots and circles or something like that. But you know, if I had to do these in monochrome, on top of monochrome base map, but people aren't going to really be able to tell. They're going to be able to tell there's a cluster here um, and a cluster there, but a lot of the individual data would be would be absent. So I decided to aggregate things. Uh, and this is something, it's mostly that I've been, I've been thinking about a lot more in the last couple years. There's been a lot of maps out there in the Twitter sphere and just cartography sphere where the people have been using uh, hexagonal binning uh, as a way of just, you know, especially when you have a lot of scattered data. It's a way of, instead of asking people to look at, you know, the scatter, especially if the scatter doesn't have a significant pattern uh, that's important, like a dot density map might. Um, if you just want people to know what is the summary of all this information in each area, then a hexagon is kind of a way, a way to do that. Uh, I also had hexagons in mind, I think, because I recently did a little project. Um, if you look at my blog, I just posted something that uses some hexagons. The quest for the blue moon. Um, I. I live in the upper Midwest of the United States, and there is an ice cream flavor here called Blue Moon, which, growing up, I did not realize people in other parts of the country, or even the other parts of the world, did not have. Uh, Blue Moon is a, it's a flavor that's a little hard to describe, and it's different at different ice cream places, but I decided to map where can you find Blue Moon, and I used some hexagons for that. So I kind of already had hexagons in mind, 
And one of the reasons I did hexagons for this was because I literally had, um, if we look down here, this is what my data set really looked like. All of these um, reddish colored dots are places where you can buy ice cream. According to Yelp, I used the Yelp database. And there's a lot, and there's you know, 40,000 ice cream shops in the US and Canada, roughly. And all the blue dots on top were all places where you could get Blue Moon flavor ice cream, at least according to the way I did my search in Yelp. There's a lot of caveats, and I recommend reading the article that I posted about it if you want to understand how I got it and some of the caveats to the data. But basically, I was like, I can't ask people to look at a zillion dots and really discern a pattern of where is this one flavor of ice cream more or less uh, common. So instead, I broke everything up into a hexagon grid, and then for each grid cell, I looked at, well, how many ice cream places are there in that location, in that grid, and how many places uh, have Blue Moon flavor ice cream? And just look at a ratio. So it's a nice way of summarizing to, you know, you lose some spatial quality, like, you know, you lose some of those details, but it, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, your right. aggregation is a key for that. Absolutely. Aggregation is valuable at times. I think when the pattern is bigger than the fine details, as it were, and in the case of my trees, it's mostly just like things are lumped together. People are not going to be able to see the pattern. I need to, like, take all the dots and show you here's the bottom line so you know I you know you're saying it's a vague question but I think it's an important question too so it's you know it's a lot of a lot of the time I don't even know where I get my inspirations or ideas there's just like some random thing pops into my brain and I think huh I saw somebody doing this thing or I want to try this thing or I'm bored and this seems appealing but it's it's somewhat random, but sometimes there's at least a little bit of an idea behind it. In the hexagon specifically, I had some ideas that said, you know, this is just going to make it easier to handle my data. Plus, everybody thinks hexagons are cool. They're really popular in data viz. And there is a, uh, a video on YouTube. Let me look here. Um... If any of you follow the popular YouTuber CGP Grey, he just posted a video a few days ago called Hexagons are the Bestigons, and talking about all of the peculiar advantages that hexagons have. So it's very apropos, especially the 30-day um, the map challenge uh, had a hexagon day. Uh, looks like it was on the 4th of November. Which is not to say that you can't do a hexagon map later on. You know, this is not strict, and as Topi will say, both on you know Twitter, on GitHub, etc. Like, you don't have to sign up anywhere, no restrictions, and you, you can just do stuff afterwards if you feel like it. And so, I uh, I posted my one of the versions of the ice cream map as my hexagon day. I submitted a couple other versions where I tried some like various surfaces to get data out of all those points, like kernel density, etc. But it's a long-winded answer to your question, but I don't know if that helps a little bit, but that's kind of why I went in hexagons in, in this case. So, yeah. Um, now let me get my YouTube windows and all that stuff recombobulated. Stick all that over there in browser tabs on, off to the side where you can't see. It doesn't get in the way of QGIS. So I just thought it'd be kind of nice to aggregate sort of the general quality of, in each of these areas, where are you more likely to find trees and where are you more likely to find good trees and not as good trees? kind of thing, because they're because in my personal experience, just on the ground, I found some patterns. Oh, I'm glad it was helpful. Thanks for thanks for listening. Uh, so one of these two layers has all my data. That's this one. What's this other one? Was this just one of my intermediates? Yes, it was. We can get rid of that. Nobody cares about it anymore. Oh, yes, I was going to download some data. Because I want to know where the water is, where the lakes are, specifically the two big lakes here in Madison, so that I can eventually delete those hexagons. Uh, and I'm going to use Quick OSM. Which, let me just bring that into view here. It's a really handy thing. Uh, and you know, if you're familiar with OpenStreetMap data, it's all free. It's all great. This is just a nice way to just query OpenStreetMap data and download a subset of it for whatever you need. And I always forget 
what the tags are that I want to use, um, but I think <coughs> I think this is natural equals water in the canvas extent that I have. All right, so I was just going to download OSM for just the area I can see. And what it's actually doing is if you go behind the scenes, um, you know, it's supposed to generate, um, well, it's supposed to show the overpass query that it's going to generate. Well, run it anyway and see what happens. Well, it's supposed to show here the win in the window like the what the specifics of the query of overpass are, but that's fine. It looks like it worked anyway. So I downloaded everything tagged in OpenStreetMap is natural equals water. Although this lake isn't showing up till I zoom out and move around, so that's fun. As long as it exports to Illustrator, that's all I care about. Uh, so yeah, this is going to help us, and I'm not gonna. I'm not going to. Um, you know, I could do like some kind of intersect where I, you know, select which hexagons overlap the water automatically, but I want to do this manually because, in some cases, I might want to delete certain hexagons and not in other cases, because it's possible that just based on where the trees line up, they might be on some of these ones by the water. And I might want to keep those, uh, whereas other one, other areas I might want to delete. So I'm just it's going to be easier for me to manually curate where those boundaries go. With that, I think I have what I need. I really just need this hexagon layer and this um, water layer. But I'm going to need three versions of the hexagon layer that tell me where to place my symbols in Illustrator, my little tree symbols. So let's style this up based on some numbers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have, I'm going to look at how many, I graduated here, how many areas had unremarkable trees. And you know, I could do like, you know, classify this so that we show up all of the hexagons, um, you know, that had one tree versus two tree versus three, four, five. But instead I'm going to, I'm going to lump these together because I'm mean, going to have all these symbols around. It's going to be kind of hard for somebody to tell um, tell many, many different symbol sizes apart. So just like I collapsed my four ratings into three, I'm going to collapse this down into three sizes of trees. It's going to be a little tiny tree when there's only, you know, a little tiny tree, a medium tree, and a big tree, I think. So what I think I'm going to do is if there's one or two trees, so let's make this three. Uh, if there's one to two trees, and these numbers are inclusive, so this is going to be one to two, which means this class here actually starts at like more than two. Uh, and oh, hello, it's a cat. That's the bonus I should have advertised on Twitter. Like, hey, if you tune in, there's going to be a stream cat. I am. Oh, hello, yes. I am presently uh, housing a couple of cats for a friend of mine who's undergoing some housing instability right now. So this is Luna, and Luna is very friendly, but Luna, why don't you get on my lap instead of on the keyboard? Won't that be great? Yeah. Luna is very affectionate, so it's nice to have, have her around for a little while. And she has a... There's another cat somewhere around here, Pandora. Looks like she's, looks like she's sleeping in a chair over there. All right, just don't hit any keyboard buttons. Um, my I want my next class to be anything that's three to four trees. So one to two, three to four, and then if there's anything, five. Because I know my numbers just looking at the table before were one, two, three, four, five. So we're going to class of one to two, three to four, and then five. Uh, so make this all the way up to and inclusive of four. And then four to five is actually really just five. So actually, just to make this easier on my brain, I'm going to type halves in there, because I know there's no numbers that are halves. Because it always trips me up, like, whoop, oh, do not expand that one. It does not need to be huge. Whether or not the class boundary is inclusive on the bottom side of the top. Four to five. Great. All right, so. A lot of places with small, and a couple of medium, and one large. Great. 
Um, that's what I'm going to need there. Let's set up a print layout. Oh man, it's 2.45 already. I've been taking up so much of your time. No idea how much time people are willing to spend. I'm going to add a map here. I'm not real picky about the layout here. It's not going to matter too much for what I'm doing. Um, the main thing I need to know is um, I'm just going to also I'm going to save this before just in case something happens. I should probably have this data set saved. Um, 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 tree grid. That sounds great. All right, plus I'm going to need a separate copy of it anyway. So I can make sure that whole grid is covered. I'm going to resize and reshape the layout and everything in Illustrator. So it's going to be fine as long as I'm just gathering all the data. Except where is where's Mother Lake? I zoom out, it shows up. Why is it not showing up here? Let's let's save these in my current coordinate system. That might help. Might help. Yeah, all right. You know, the projection on the fly sometimes gets a little finicky. Yeah, that yeah, that great that quick OSM is pretty great. Like I, you know, I've read, I read the CP article and I thought, oh, that's that's interesting. It just filed away in the back of my mind. Then suddenly I had a project where I'm like, wow, I'm now using this all the time. This is great. So it's it was it's probably one of the most immediately useful cartographic perspectives articles I've ever read. Because the next week I was suddenly like, oh, I know how to do that real easy versus, you know, going on the web and downloading big bulks of data or something like that. All right, now that's showing up. Great. Um, so I'm going to have my bulk grid. Yeah, um, we're aligned here. And I've got my hexagons for the... Uh, which value was it, actually? No, I want to... For the unremarkable trees. Okay. Yep. I'm just going to make a PDF. Unremark. All right, and then I'm going to do the same thing for the worthwhile trees, which have a different distribution. And I'm just going to export that. And then finally, quality trees which there's always just one to two of them around. But I mean, that's why they're the highest quality. They're the rarest. I knew somebody who uh, had a movie rating system where if you gave a movie one star, well, if you gave a movie two stars, that meant it was 10 times better than a movie that was one star. And I think he was like expecting to see only one five-star movie in his lifetime or something like that. On a logarithmic scale. All right, so now I've got few different PDFs here. Let me just pull these up into Illustrator. So we get to actually applying this stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of separate everything out by color. So I'm going to select that, just one of the squares, and uh, select same fill and stroke. Now, got all those brown hexagons. And I just dragged them up into another layer. These are my base hexagons. And the way this file gets written out, the fills and the strokes are separate. I don't need those anymore. And I'm just going to do a shortcut, Command-6. You see it showed up there, Command-6 on my little keyboard shortcut trapper. And that meant repeat my last selection, which was select, same, fill, and stroke. So now it selects everything that matches these, which is just um, which is just black with no no fill. So it's all these little extra outlines just got selected. Now they're all gone. Uh, I'm just going to take these two lakes. I don't really need the rest. They're just going to be there as a reference for me later on. I turn that off for a while. I select all the other lakes. 
delete those. And now all I've got left are my hexes and some other junk. I go into my uh, command Y there, and that's the, uh, pre the outline view versus the preview. I can see every bit of vector artwork that I have left, including like some things that are white so they didn't show up. But here I just have all my hexes, so I'm just going to do this and select them all. It looks like I selected the edges of these boxes here too. I'm just going to delete those boxes. Those are clipping masks and things that got output that make sense for PDF, but not for me. All right, tree data. And I'm just going to organize this into three sublayers. So I'm going to have the number five when there's five of them. And I need another layer for the one there's three to four. And then when there's one to two, select everything in the layer, unselect those two, and then everything in the layer is white. All the bottom level, and just drag them in. So now I've got everything organized. I'll need that for later. And this is going to be the trees that are unremarkable. Unremark okay, just drag that underneath so I can see them. And later on, we're going to use this as a basis for replacing our trees with some data, with some with our tree symbols that we got over here. But first, well, let's save this. W1, working file number one, my most popular file name. And let's pull up the trees that are in the next class up worthwhile. And I got these clipping groups here. I can um, can release all these clipping masks if I want to. Actually, no. The first thing before I undo any of that, I want to paste everything. Copy this thing. This is Command C. Go over here and paste in place. So all that lines up. Should line up perfectly. Yeah. The new hexes that dropped in look to be exactly aligned on the old ones, so it worked. So now I can. At least all those clipping masks, my command option seven, and just start deleting junk that I don't need. These are all locked, so I'm not going to accidentally select my other stuff. Always lock the layers you're not working with. Worthwhile. Uh, make the three subgroups one to two, three to four, and five. All right, uh, select everything that's got that color. It's three to four. Turn those off so I can see the ones that I can select. I mean, it's white is going to go there. And this red one, select by color, is going to go there. All right, now we get our worthwhile ones. One more. Uh, quality, pull that in. And in this case, there's only one class. Paste in place. Lock those. Just click and drag a little selection over the edges. This only gets just a corner of some of these boxes, and this way I can delete just the boxes. And now, here, select all the white hexes without their boundaries, and that's it. And the quality ones are just one to two. So now I've got something to work with. So let's start with our base hexes. I want them to be black. And when I was doing my tests before, and I had originally made everything with white boundaries. Oh, don't need you. I should save this too. I gave, gave all the hexagons white boundaries. And boy, that's hard on the eyes. That's, that's tough. And you know, it helps if I tone them down a little bit, like make the strokes thinner. But in the end, I settled on dotted lines. Because this way, you still get a sense of where the hexagon boundaries are, but it also lowers them in the visual hierarchy. Because we don't want them to be the visually dominant thing, it's context information. And if I were working in color, then I'd have a lot of options to make a color for the hexagon boundaries that isn't real prominent. 
you know, I could just say, let's, you know, make a, a dark gray, for example, on top of this black. So they're there and noticeable, but don't stand out. But since I don't have any shades of gray in between for the challenge that I've set, the way that I can get this done best is really just to uh, instead give them a dashed line. So I select all my hexes. And I'm just going to hide my boundaries. That's Command H, but I'll just show you where on the menu hide edges. Because when you select something in Illustrator, it highlights it in a color just to let you know. But I don't want to see those little hi red highlight edges over everything, so I just Command H to turn that off and on a lot. And we go to the stroke here. And if I turn on dashed line, it remembers my last settings, so that's why the dotted line comes up. But some people wonder about how to make dotted lines, because you can, if you just turn on dashed lines, you can say, well, I want a, I want a dash that's a certain width and a gap between the dashes that is a certain width. But how do you make dotted lines? And the way you make a dotted line is that you know, you, if I zoom way in here, you see these strokes have a flat edge. I can turn them to a round cap. So now they have a rounded edge. And then if I make dots that are very tiny, uh, dashes that are very thin, then those rounded caps, see the actual dash itself is very tiny now, but the rounded caps basically give it a, uh, a dotted look. So that's kind of fun. And they don't look perfectly rounded because I've got it here where it's set to align to the, it's actually changing my width to make sure that it lines up perfectly at corners. Whereas I could tell it to not do that and then you'd get this, but at least they'd be thinner. Let's make that even thinner. There we go, 0.01. So that, that's pretty close. That's pretty good. I mean, it bothers me slightly that there's a little edge when you zoom in uh, to 6400%. Um, but I'm, I'm trying really hard to learn to let things go like that, especially on a quick map like this. The fact it's not a perfect circle. Ah, I mean, the reason it's not a perfect circle, actually, uh, actually, maybe I will solve this. Uh, is is because you know these are overlapping hexagons, so the two versions of each stroke. There's a way to solve that, and maybe I'll come back to that a little bit later when I remove the the excess hexagons. Um, so in the meanwhile, let's spread these out a little bit more. Yeah, okay. And we'll fine tune that a little later when we get our trees in there and see how all that looks. Um, we'll also deal with lakes once we have the trees. So. What I need to do is get some tree symbols in here. And as I said, you know, this is this this is the symbol I designed before. So let's just bring this in. Um maybe I'm on a working layer here where I look at my trees. And I'm gonna I'm gonna need room for three of them in any given hexagon. Oh I was Confused from like where'd that hexagon go? It's got a white thing over it. It's not that it got deleted. I just need to remember that some of my data are white right now. So I want to kind of arrange roughly where these things are going to go. Uh, I did actually also think about a triangular tessellation, uh, where you just have a whole bunch of triangles, but the triangles change their orientation. So and if I had one triangle like that. No, no, I wanted to make a copy of you. There we go. And then like a triangle like this, and so on. But then the tree symbols would change their orientation all the time, and I thought that'd be confusing. I'd rather have each tree type exist in the same spot. So we're going to take you, and we're going to center you there. And we're going to take these two things and spread them out a little bit group them together so I can click on this thing and center them against that. All right, so they're perfectly centered. I want the largest symbol, I think, to be larger, though. So I'm also going to select all these. And we're going to go um, transform each. Command, Option, Shift, D. I want them to be almost bursting out here so they just take up as much space as possible. Yeah, I think that'll work. And they're going to come in three sizes uh, that I'm going to need to use. So let's see here. Let's pick another hexagon over here for a second and decide, well, 
what's the smallest I want them to be? Well, how big is this map actually going to be? Because the extent of my data on the screen let me flip like that. So that's how big the trees are really going to be. So I want to maybe go. Hmm. Let's 50%. Can I do 33? Is that still going to be fine when I zoom way out such that we have all the data? And again, it's, you know, if I were printing this, which I'm not going to, that would be one thing. It'd be easy to tell. But, you know, for screen presentations, some people might look at it on a phone, some on a website. It's kind of a crapshoot. I think actually I want them to be a little bit bigger, those trees. So instead of 33, 45. Yeah, okay. And one more size test. Something that looks good in between. Like 75. Yeah, I think that's kind of easily readable as three sizes. There's the big ones, the medium ones, and the small ones. Actually, I'll do 70%. Yeah, okay. So we're going to have some trees that are white, um, some trees that are, that are black. And since they're on a black background, that means you can't see them, so they're going to need a white stroke. And, you know, by default, strokes in Illustrator are aligned, centered, you know, they're exactly, they run exactly down the middle of the shape, but I'm going to run them outside the shape so they don't look, you know, so they don't obliterate any of the, uh, any of the actual shape. And we'll make that a lot thinner, even thinner, uh, 0.3, that sounds good. Yeah, I think that works. And it works when you zoom out, too. And I just want to, now that this thing is like that, I want to nudge it up, nudge them all up with just a hair. Like a half point. Just so it doesn't get too close to the bottom. I also should round my corners here. Just so it looks a little smoother on the bottom there. And then finally, for the tree that's halfway in between, the quality of the best and the worst, you know, my tests, I tried a couple of things. I tried some stripes, but I think it's just not going to work, especially as you get small. It just kind of becomes messy. So I think just a, you know, just something like that, where you do half and half, I think that's going to be fine. And the way I'm going to do that actually is I'm going to make a symbol, uh, which is just a little repeating piece of artwork. So I'm just going to copy this over here, Alt-Drag, make a new symbol that I'm going to edit. So let's go in here. Um, and just for a second, I'm going to turn this outline pink so I can see, because when you edit symbols, it's on a white background. I don't know if you can change that or not. But just so I can tell where the outer edge is. What I want to do is, um, well, actually, I want to edit the full size one. Yeah, I want to edit the full size one here. Because, and then I'll just shrink it down when I'm done. Okay, color, yeah, make that some color I can see. And then let's just draw a line through here. Um, yeah. Well, actually, I wonder if that's going to. This might cause a problem the way I want to do it. If I use that line to split this artwork into two pieces, uh, that works. That works pretty well. So let me go back to say what I did. I just got this line, and I'm going to make sure that line lines up right there. It just seems nice to play off that corner. And then I'm going to use that line, and I'm going to select my line and my shape. And I'm just going to go to the Shape Builder. Shift M, so if you saw the shortcut come up here, Shift M, capital M, Shape Builder tool. And I really wish 
there was like a version of this in GIS because it seems so cool. I can do things like click and now that's its own shape. You can click and combine shapes, there's clicking and dragging. I can alt click and delete things. It's so cool. But just by clicking here, I've now taken this and made it two separate shapes divided along that line. So I'll say that one's black, and that one's white, and I realize the problem in what I've just done here is that the boundary line is going to go between them because they're independent shapes. So instead, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have separate fills and strokes. So let's make a copy of these two things. Command C to go to the clipboard, and then paste in front, Command F. And I'm actually going to take these two things and rejoin them so I have a hole. And I'm just going to have this version on top have the stroke. And the two versions on the bottom have their individual black and white fills, but no stroke. So now I've got the outline over it. And I'm going to turn that back to white. And I'm done with editing my symbol, so let's go back. So now that's what my half tree looks like. So that's not bad. I think that'll work. I kind of like it a little better than than the half and half side to side. I think it's a little more dynamic and interesting. Um, I played around with that earlier. I also played around with, you know, besides the uh, striped patterns. Do I still have it in this test file? No, I don't. Um, and if you hear background noise, there's a there's a train going by. There are also jets going by earlier. Um, I tried a, a little dot pattern fill as well, a semi-random one that I thought looked kind of cool that uh, I had actually worked on in this um, Atlas project for Great Lakes Islands. You can see the dot patterns are nice semi-randomized, but again, when you shrank things down, it just looked weird. So, you know, you're spared the hour of me messing around with that because I already did it, and this stream would be even longer. All right, so now let's enact this whole thing. So, yes, I do have all kinds of transportation. That's quite right, Ibrahim. I've got uh, we get trains, we got jet fighters. Uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a uh, parade of cars came down my street. It's just it's a quiet residential street. It's not like a busy intersection or anything, but they were just there were five or ten cars all honking their horns, and it was it was kind of it was intended as a nice thing. It was a uh, a local school here uh, you know the students are are attending remotely and so the teachers were from that elementary school were just going down the street and honking and saying hi to their students and saying that they missed them so it was nice but it would have been uh, been real annoying and distracting if I were trying to if I were trying to present I was actually preparing at that time they came down the street while I was practicing my nasus presentation for the for a conference I a virtual conference I did a couple of weeks ago and uh, so I just I could not focus and I kept saying oh gee I hope that does not happen when I have to do the real conference and fortunately the real presentation was was quiet people curse but I do I do have some experience I don't know if I mentioned this before Ibrahim but I actually uh, I lived for three months in Cairo uh, I, w I was a study abroad student there, and so it was, it was interesting to see the differences in, in driving culture and how that works. And uh, a few years later, there was a documentary that came out, which I don't know if you've seen. It's called Cairo Drive, and it's about, it's about you know, drivers and how things work there. And I remember that, you know, they played it for an American audience here in, in the United States, and and I was the only person who wasn't, like, surprised by all of the differences you know, like the way the pedestrians interact with traffic in Egypt is very different than what they do in the United States. You know, and, and that was something I had to learn when I was in Cairo. And, you know, for those of you who are listening who are less familiar, there's very much a lot of just wading out into the middle of the street and kind of wandering through and dodging around cars. And that became very normal to me after a while. But, you know, when my friends watched this documentary later about what it was like there. They were just shocked, and everybody in the audience gasped at, at the danger. But I was like, oh, well, that's just normal. That's just what people do in a different part of the world, in a different culture. So it's kind of fun. But yeah, I studied abroad in, in Egypt in 2002, I want to say. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Wow, 18 years ago. I was in, I was in college. So I spent three months at the American University in Cairo as a, as a study abroad program. And then I went back a couple of years later 
and just did uh, did some general tourism because there are a lot of things I didn't see in Egypt that tourists might do because like when you live in a place, I was like, well, I'm going to be here for months. I'll have plenty of time to go, you know, see things that tourists might see. And then you're like, well, I'm leaving now and I never, like, I never saw the Egyptian museum. I've been here three months, so maybe I'll, so later on, a couple of years later, I went back uh, and met up with somebody, some people who were studying abroad in Kenya and they flew up from Kenya to, to meet with me. So it was a good time and hopefully I'll, I'll get back there someday, maybe if I ever have money to do things like travel. Uh, so let's see, where was I? Oh, wonderful, yeah. If I if I head out that way, I'll let you definitely let you know. It could be where, uh, if you don't mind sharing, uh, where in Egypt are you located? I I got a chance to visit around a, a few different parts of the country here and there. You know, mostly based in Cairo, but went down. You know, did some tourism down in Luxor and and hung out in Iskandreya a couple of times too, which. I've, I studied classical history, so it was nice to go see, like, Greek and Roman ruins and things up there. Uh, yeah, so I was going to actually make these symbols happen, wasn't I? I should probably save my file. It's been a while. I'll save a new version. Always make sure to save multiple versions of your file as you go along. Because occasionally files get corrupted. On the eastern part of the delta, okay, I never got, I mean, I, the only sort of area on the delta I got up to was, was Alexandria. But definitely a lot more of the country to see. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn all these colors, these color hexagons into trees. So how do we do that? Well, I can use my favorite, one of my favorite illustrator scripts. Uh, if you've ever seen um, if you just Google, you can also find and replace. If you go Google Illustrator, Kelso find and replace Illustrator. Nathaniel Kelso, a cartographer, wrote a script that finds and replaces graphics in Illustrator. I've been told the newest versions of Illustrator have a tool that does this a little bit now, but I'm just so used to using this script. There's this awesome script here that I'm going to demonstrate the use of, but this is where you get it. Um, you can download it. If you click the download, it may take you to the actual text of the script. So just you know, right click instead, right click the download link and save it. Uh, it's a super powerful, useful thing. But what I'm going to do is I am going to tell Illustrator to find to to take everything I've selected and replace it with a different thing I've selected. So I want to find all of the hexagons I have that are quality trees, high quality trees here. And I want to replace them with this one, with this small version of a tree. Because I know they're all one to two. Just mark that, you know, one to two. And I'm going to say, like, replace them all, all those hexagons with this symbol of a tree. Now, I select all the hexagons and I select my tree. And the thing is, how does it know what things to replace with what? It's the thing on top in our layers panel that gets that replaces all the stuff below. So I'm just going to move this up on top. My little scratch layer, I've got the tree drawn. So now I've got that selected and I've got the hexagon selected. And I'm going to go. I didn't I don't have it installed in my scripts menu. I never bothered to get around to that. So I'm just going to go other script, desktop, find or replace. And there we go. It just replaced all of those all those things with the little tree symbol great and it deleted my original so that there's not a duplicate so oh hey chris good to see you here yeah it's find and replace is awesome i use it constantly and you know there is a replace artwork thing that i haven't learned in the new illustrator that i think does some of this looks for similar similar shapes so it might, it might get this done but this is the way that i'm used to it and that's the nice thing about Illustrator, like GIS, like a lot of other programs, there's a zillion ways to do the same thing. All right, so now with my worthwhile trees, uh, worthwhile squares, now we get a couple of different values to share. So I'm actually going to need this symbol. I'm just going to make some copies in a few different sizes. And I think we scaled this to 45 before and 70. Those look about right. Yeah, that's the same size. Just mouse and over, yep, that's the same size. Very good. Okay, so the worthwhile trees. 
the weak ones, the the the, rather the ones with very few, and we're just gonna select those and select this and just do it again. We're gonna do this a few times. And then we're just gonna mass move all the trees once we've got them, because right now they're all going to the center of the hexagon, and we'll fix that in a bit. Right. Three to four. There's actually a one of them, but we're gonna find and replace it anyway so we can get some experience with this script. And Illustrator scripting, there is so many cool so many cool things out there to look up that you can do. Um, maybe I'll make a little recommendation actually. A couple of there have been a couple presentations. Uh, and the NASIS conference, which has all of its videos online. If I spell scripting correctly, yeah. So there have been a couple of. So Jamie Robinson Robertson has done a couple of presentations of you know, both this year and at NASA's twenty seven Montreal. So I find the twenty seventeen ones, um, enhancing productivity with scripts and shortcuts, and he just takes you through a whole bunch of cool stuff that you can do in Illustrator. It's it's mind-blowing. It's definitely worth checking out. So, you know, have a have a look. Search the Nasus YouTube. Search for Nasus YouTube and then search for scripting and you can find Jamie's presentations. They're pretty awesome. All right, and then replace this one. And then finally, unremarkable And I'm just going to make a copy. I'm going to need to remember where those three tree positions are later on. Because uh, I'm going to use them as a guide to move things. Unremarkable trees. Well, let's start here. And just repetitive tasks, which I find relaxing. I really like the part of the mapping where you, where you have a plan. Because I hate it, like when when I don't know what I'm doing, I don't have a good visual idea yet. It's incredibly stressful. But finally, when I know what I need to do and what's going to look like, then it's just chill. Just just keep doing the work, you know. Like especially when I get to labeling, and I've talked about this in other live streams and conferences and things like that. It's just nice to like crank through that with music, relax, and just do the work. And I know where it needs to go, so that feels comfortable. And that's kind of what we're we are with this. Okay, so now we've got everything replaced by its appropriate tree symbol, but you know, of course, they're overlapping because there's places with multiple kinds of trees of each class, so that's annoying. So what do we do? Well, we're going to move them. So I'm just going to go back to my guides here, and I'm going to use the fact the position of these three trees. Just do a quick drag on all my trees so I know where they need to go. Um, what I need to do here. Okay, um, first off, I'm going to move all these to an empty hexagon that I can mess around with just so that I. Yeah, there we go. Centered that little group of trees. And second, I'm going to make a copy of this thing, and I'm going to center that on the hexagon. And the reason for that is I'm going to select this tree. This is for our lowest category, all our unremarkable trees. They're, they're nice trees. I feel bad calling them that. They're perfectly reasonable trees. It's just that from a tree climbing enjoyment exercise fun perspective, there wasn't much to say about them. I'm probably not going to go back. Notice I've got them all selected, everywhere they are. But I've also specifically got this one that I just made up in the middle. And now I'm going to move it. And I'm also moving all the other ones at the same time, so they're all moving into the correct position in their respective hexes. See, they all moved down. That's pretty great. And, you know, I could have done this the other way around where I, you know, put all the trees in place and then resized them instead of resizing them and putting them in place. Doesn't really matter. Order of operations. 
Uh, now I'm just going to do this again. Take that one, move it to center so that and upper right of the worthwhile one. So let's take that worthwhile and this one and then move all the worthwhile ones all at the same time to get to be aligned there. And it's not quite perfect and that's normally what I would obsess over, but you know, trying to learn to be okay with not quite perfect. It's hard. It's real hard. And then finally, for the quality ones, which they're all the same size, tiny symbol as I recall, but that's fine. And so they all moved along with it. And so now they're all centered. And don't need you anymore, my scratch layer with all my fake trees. Now they're all in position. So we can see how the patterns start to come out. There are areas with more trees in general where there's bigger symbols and fewer trees where there's not many of each. And then the size of the symbol is how many of each particular variety. Like this area, a lot of worthwhile trees there. That's good to know. Up here, a lot of not great trees. So probably don't go climbing up in that zone. That kind of thing. So now we've got that. Let's put all that in one big layer of tree symbols. Spell it correctly. Next up, we're going to get rid of some of our hexagons. And I'm actually going to just... Eh, I probably don't need to do that. I was going to change the dotted line, but I think that's fine for a minute. And here's where there's a little manual curation, because I don't want to get rid of hexagons where there are trees in them, but I do kind of want to keep to the edge. That's why I didn't do it, you know, in some sort of automated algorithm. I figured it's just going to be faster to do it manually here. So let's just take our lakes for a minute and turn them into an outline so I know where we're at. And say like, yeah, let's get rid of that one. I'm just going to create a little edge here that kind of works for the isthmus. And I don't need to do everything down here because you know this this map is limited in how far it's gonna it's gonna extend. I'm gonna trim off part of it. I exported way too much stuff versus what I needed, which is always better than exporting way too little stuff. All right, so this is gonna skirt the edge of those trees. You know the the tree symbol. There was one tree on one side of the lake, but the hexagon happens to draw everything on the other side of the lake. That's always the challenge with hexagons versus coastlines. They can make things seem Outside, you know, it's a. If I go back to my um, blog post where I had the blue moon maps, pull one of those up. You know, the so you can see some of these hexagons way, way over here, hanging off of the coast because technically, I'm resizing these hexagons based on the data, and the actual boundary of the hexagon just catches part of the edge of the coast, and there's some data there, so. But when you shrink the hexagon, then, you know, sometimes they fall outside the boundary. So that's that's kind of the downside to hex mapping. One of them is that you get these situations. But I'm going to abstract things enough in this map. Probably doesn't matter. Just kind of get a little graceful out to the edge of the, of the lake. And now I can start to select bigger chunks and delete those. So that's pretty good. That's the edge of one lake. And I don't even know if the map is going to go up to the next lake. We'll see. I might just zoom in enough where it doesn't matter. And this is just one of the times when it's sometimes faster to do things manually than automatically. So that's pretty good. Especially because I'm thinking, you know, the edge of the map is going to be... Hmm, let's, let's decide that, actually, before we get too far. Yeah, maybe that. Let's go to View, Trim View. There's something new they added recently in Illustrator. You can trim things to your artboard. If I'm not going to have part of the lake, I either got to kind of commit to having part of the lake on the other side or trimming it back here. Yeah, that's kind of, that kind of works. 
I mean, this is a pretty abstracted map, and I, you know, could spend hours obsessing over how do I get more useful geometry in there, like, you know, some roads for context, etc. But I think that this will this will work. Um, do I want to cut that one? I'm gonna cut that one out. And this lake will give us a place maybe to put our legend or something like that. All right, so next, there's a couple of oddities here that I need to solve. Um, first off, notice how those, those dots are causing some problems at the weird looking edge here. And also, I think I mentioned before, that the dots are not perfect. Well, a couple of things will help us move towards solving that. I'm going to take my hexagons. I'm going to make a little copy of them for a second. I'm also going to save a new version of my file, because I deleted a bunch of stuff. So if I ever need it back, I can always go back to the older version of the file. Uh, you know, if you, if you have polygons in a GIS, um, sometimes you might want the internal boundaries of those polygons rather than polygons themselves. You might want a line feature file. And this is something also maybe you've seen in Natural Earth where they'll give you like a polygon polygon file for countries, every country's polygon, or they'll give you lines that are just the boundaries between them. You can get the same thing in Illustrator. You can process polygons to get that data. If they're topologically perfect, which these should be, we'll see, uh, I can go and use the Pathfinder tools. Where's the Pathfinder tools? It says they're open. Oh, they're off screen over here. I don't have a lot of interface room here, so I kept them off. I this thing called outline. Uh, can I use hexagon borders to trace roads? Yeah, you know, I actually, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that. Thanks for the suggestion, Ivan. It's, um, you know, I thought about, or the river. Of course, the river, I think, uh, actually heads between these these polygons. So maybe I might go back afterwards as another step and get that sort of thing going on. Pulling some other open street map data for, like, a major road, like... East Washington Avenue is kind of the big one that a lot of people in Madison would know. Maybe Atwood, a couple of other ones. Um, so maybe I'll like do this, get the, the legend, and get this into a semi-finalized state, and then think about adding more stuff. So outline. Where'd everything go? Well, everything just became invisible. Like no fill, no stroke. Um, or actually, it says it's black fill and stroke, but the stroke is zero. So you can see a little bit of it. It's weird. I don't know why they do that. Um, but here's what we do. Um, our artwork has been restyled. And I'm just going to give it an actual stroke for a second. Now, notice it's just lines, line segments. And there's not it's not doubled anymore. There's just one line segment per polygon overlap edge. So it's really, really useful. So what can I do with that? Well, go back to my layers. I can say, let's take all of our ordinary hexagons before. Just make them black. Nothing else. Boundary. Just a boundary on them. And then turn this new version of my hexagons on. Give them a white boundary. Give them a dashed line that's actually a dotted line. And now there's only one line, so everything is perfect here. And if I want, I can now go through and clean up this edge by getting rid of just the little edge pieces here. And what I'm going to do is I need to make sure that I lock the fill hexes. Yeah, so now that's going to look a little cleaner. And again, that's the sort of thing I could have done in GIS too. You, there's, there are processing operations that will give you give you those edges, but I already happened to be here when I made the decision of what I wanted, so that's fine. All right, so hex fills, hex strokes. OK, so now, and again, this is where we get to the point where um, I'm going to make a little legend, but I want to emphasize again, I think I commented somewhere Maybe it was on, 
maybe it was on uh, Twitter, maybe it was on the spatial community Slack, that this symbology may be considered ill-conceived in the sense that, like, am I... Am I really expecting people to extract very much out of it? Because, like, the hexagons with three things in each hexagon and size, and there's, like, a stripe down the middle of this It's easy to get clever with your symbology in a way that maybe is tough for the reader. But, you know, where it's more for your own benefit as the creator. But that, I think in this case that's fine for me to just have fun with this. And this symbology makes some sense to you because I've been explaining it to you for, what, an hour and a half now that I've been making this map. But obviously... Um, you know, if I just threw this map directly in front of somebody, it might take them a little bit of time to dig through it. I, I am guilty in many instances in the past of making symbologies that are overly complicated, and I've tried to tried to choke things back, which is one reason why I'm at least making these so that there's, you know, there's fewer sizes, fewer symbols, etc. Uh, are there illustrators? Shane. Oh, welcome, Shane. Um, are there illustrator speed competitions? You know, I don't know be kind of interesting. I've, uh, the only kind of game-like thing that I've heard about is layer tennis. Um, this is something that Tanya Anderson has told me about that she's, she used to do, uh, where you basically, you start with an illustrator file and you do some stuff in a layer and then you hand it over to another person and then they do some other things and they hand it over to another person. So it's kind of like building a file together. And what I would probably try and do is if you saw my last live stream, I talked about the appearance panel and some of the complicated effects you can do. I'd probably like try and show off, like, oh, look at, look at the complicated Illustrator effects wizardry that I did. But um, I've actually done that with clients because sometimes I have clients who use Illustrator, and I'm like, I did a cool thing for before I handed the file to you. Isn't it cool? And they're like, no, I just can't understand your file. So there's there's some downsides to that too. Let's uh, let's make ourselves a little legend here. You know, lots of maps, I think, lots of maps don't need legends, but this one's going to need some help. Um, definitely going to need some help for people to figure out. So how do I want to arrange this thing? Hmm. Think about how the, what the symbols are going to look like and where it's going to go. Um, I think I'll just do like a grid. Kind of like a grid of, of two by three, like each of the three simple sizes, the, the three simple sizes, and the rather the, and the sorry three by three, the three simple sizes and the three simple uh, colors. And then maybe we'll remove the ones that don't exist because there's no different sizes for the uh, highest quality trees. I think that's a good idea. Okay, we'll, we'll work in the lake here for a minute. Um, so. Need, need some copies of all the different sizes and shapes. I guess I should have saved my real basic illustrator stuff. I'm just going to copy all these tree symbols. I just held alt and, you know, see there in my key caster, and like that's, that symbol means alt. Um, but that's why I said it out loud too. All these together bring them together in the align tool into the same spot so I can start to arrange stuff. I'm going to need a black background here while I work. I may put this over the hexagon part of the map, or I may put it in a black background over the lake. Not sure yet. I can give myself just a cheap black background for a second while I see what I got. No, oh, that disappeared. Sometimes lately illustrators made random things occasionally disappear. Very, very annoying. But I really kind of want to arrange something like this, where there's, you know, see, part of that just disappeared until I zoom in and out. It's real annoying. All right, so we're just going to do nice lowest quality and then the different sizes. Bring those over here. Can I just... Click and drag. Thanks. There we go. Okay. So this is roughly what I think we'll we'll do in the arrangement of symbols. So first off, we'll just use the align tools to align those things to each other and to each other and to each other. And then align these all in the same center. 
likewise here. And then um, we want this one to be spaced the same distance as these two. So I'm just going to go over here, move those exactly on top, and go to my uh, Command K, went to my Preferences, change my keyboard increment, say 10 points. So now when I use the arrow keys, things move 10 points. Let's make it 15. 15? No, it's 15 is too much. 12 points. 12 points looks good. Now if I move this on top, 12 points, now they're evenly spaced. Great. Okay. Give myself more room for my temporary black background. Um, go to my type tool. Um, okay, so... Three, I'm just like, I'm putting my hands over here. I'm like motioning with my hands on this, on my monitor when I'm painting out. I think I want like tree equality, and then the words here, and then the quantity on the side, two, four, okay. Yeah, okay, so let's get our character panel here. And I've been working on a project where all the maps are in Arabic, so everything's defaulting to Arabic right now. So I actually gotta switch over to like, yeah, get my t text left to right. Uh, someday maybe I can share with you what that project is, but it's all under a strict lifetime non-disclosure agreement, and it may never actually get published. We'll see. Um, Mostra Nuova. That is my go-to black and white typeface. Because I paid a bunch of money for it one day, and I'm gonna get my use out of it. Gonna, gonna get my $90 worth or whatever I paid for. All right, optical kerning, one, two, two. Yep. Stop making things vanish. Thanks. I'm sure you know the subject. It's a, uh, it's a rework. I don't, actually, I'm not, I, I don't know if I can tell you, actually. Um, the non-disclosure agreement is pretty strict, but it's a, it's an atlas. I'm redoing a bunch of maps for historical atlas, but there's some, there's some problems with the client, and I'm, I'm working with another partner on this project. There is some partners are doing the, uh, uh, a studio in Beirut is doing a lot of the layout, but we're, we're having some challenges with working with the client where this, we've made a whole bunch of work and then they wanted to change the style after approving the previous style. And so we're negotiating through that with them. And I don't know, could be, could be a long haul or maybe never, we'll see. But like if eventually if the project gets canceled, at least I think I can share some of the stuff I did, since they're not going to use it. So I'll at least have that out there. Fine. One to two, three to four, and five. And by the way, those are not hyphens. Those are end dashes. This little pedantic thing I like to talk about. That's a hyphen. Actually looks a little unbalanced here. Um, let me try kerning this auto. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Uh, hyphens are different than end dashes. Hyphens are shorter. End dashes are for ranges of things, like ranges of numbers. So there you go. Um, okay, so let's. How big is that going to be relative to the whole map? I just want to make sure the type isn't too small. See, the thing about this typeface is that it doesn't come in italics. It's hard to make a lot of distinctions. Quantity of trees. Uh, all right, so I don't, I don't know if I can make a size distinction. I don't think I can make those any smaller and still have it going to be easily legible on people's screens. Quantity of trees. Let's make that heavier and a little larger. Let's kern that optically. Usually I optically kern things because it looks a little bit better, even though it's overriding the will of the type designer. Uh, it looks actually a little funny anyway, so let's yeah, let's just kern that a little bit more. Did I get this for black and white maps specifically? Um, it's just, it seems to be, seems to be a go-to on this 
when I'm when I'm making that style though. And I don't know. Uh -huh. Come on. You know, there's only three characters. Let's set the tracking instead. That looks a little bit better. But I have used it on several, like the. Uh, uh, let me look at my another one that I've done in a very simple black and white style, and of course the uh, the atlas of Great Lakes Islands uses it. But I think I started it, started using it in these kind of maps with um, just pulling something up in my Google Drive off screen here with this thing. Uh, the Picnic Point Ice Hike map, where those of you who do not live in the Madison area and not hung out with me, um, the we live in a part of the country where lakes freeze, and so uh, once a year, I like to walk across about a mile of ice to go from part of the near edge of uh, of the University of Wisconsin campus, walk across University Bay up to a nice little spit of land called Picnic Point, and. I designed this and the typeface just looked good there so now I kind of when I make these stark black and white maps I just kind of use that but I actually bought it for I wanted this typeface for years Monstra Nuova and I just picked it I, I eventually had a project where uh, where it made sense to purchase it for a client so I did and then I just tried to get as much mileage out of it afterwards and right, quantity of trees And then tree quality. And then here's where we're going to start to run into problems, maybe just of sizes of text and things. I may go a little smaller. Unremarkable. You know, I should probably flip this because this way the longer words go on the right side. Yeah, that's a good thought. So let's take all these and make it so quality is that axis. And quantity goes, I'm just going to flip it here so that across a 90 degree reflect, uh, vertical reflect. So now, smallest on the left to right gets larger. And as you go down, it can increase in the quality. And now I just got to rotate these tree symbols, which I go transform each panel. Uh, rotate 90 degrees each one. So there we go. And so now I can just take my data here and shove it over and ah, give myself a lot more working room. Okay, give myself more working room. Yes, yeah, so the tree quality is going to be that way and the tree quantity. Just making it so the stuff appears again. Yeah. I don't. Actually, if I probably preview at the CPU versus the GPU, this may not happen anymore. Illustrator runs a little slower on my computer when I do previewing with the uh, with the CPU, but maybe it'll stop stuff from random vanishing. Um, just centering this text on the symbols. Yeah, boy, it's really cranking away now. Unremarkable. Worthwhile. And quality. Be quality. And we'll center it on that one. And then our tree quantity. See, now these are shorter, so they fit better. I should just bring the align tools actually out. Uh, view, window, align. Oh, there it is. Great. Center that. And 
this, those numbers are getting a little close, but we'll spread the trees out a little bit to help with that. Nope, I accidentally selected that tree. So we're just going to first space these up like that. And then we're going to space all the all these out a little bit more, like three points. Yeah, that's a little better. Uh, you know, it's it's not the greatest, but for a you know make it make it within one day thing, I think we'll be fine. Gotta gotta let it go sometimes. Still working on that skill. And might look better up here. Yeah, at least pairs those words better. Whereas here, I think that would look weird because there's this giant gap. So I feel like tree quality has to go on the other side. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah, you know, that's going to be fine. Okay, so. And the question is mostly about let's bring this thing in here and then just decide where it's going to go. And I'm just going to tuck that in the legend and I just hit um, command shift um, curly brace to push that thing I had selected to the bottom of the pile versus if I hit the other curly brace pushes it to the top of the pile. So now it's just in the back of that layer <coughs> of that layer. I think it look weird to have this there. We got so much dead space up here. I think we'll just do this. Have it play off the you know, play off the top edge of the graphic. Round that corner. Not that it really not that you can tell. I just always like to round corners and things like that, but you really can't tell that that's a rounded shape. Actually, let's make it so you can better. Yeah, that kind of separates a little bit more too as a, as a different thing. And also now that, now we got our tree symbols on here, I want to go back and point out the importance again of why I made those hexes dotted lines. Because if I just take that stroke dashing off, you can see how much those tree symbols fade into, you know, nothingness, no importance anymore. We're, they're getting lost. So that's why I try to push them down the visual hierarchy because it's just background. We need you to know that these data apply to these zones, but beyond that, you know, we don't need to. We don't need you to pay too much more attention to them. We want you to pay attention as a map reader to the rest of the stuff. Um, other text. Right now, I have exactly one piece of other text, and that is this is Lake Monona. And let's make that a little bigger. Track that out a little bit. And even more. Yeah. Okay. That's that's coming along. That's coming along. Yeah, I guess the question now is to go back to this idea of do we want to add anything else? Let's look at our little open street map here, what we've got for where that falls relative to where our trees fall. What, what interesting things we might add for some contextual information. Because you know, on my previous map of my tree climbs, I I put a lot of stuff in there that made it more visually interesting and gave people, if they knew, even if you didn't know Madison, there's more visual interest by having this stuff. That's the real, that's the real um, advantage. Um, I guess you could do river and creek, maybe. Uh, I don't want, you know, that many roads. You know, I had some neighborhood labels, but I don't know if I do. I want to do the neighborhood labels. Um, hmm. Maybe I'll, okay, so let's, let's try this. Um, 
Do the natural water line features? I don't think it's. Yeah. Okay, that's just the edges of the water. There's another thing to actually get some rivers. Um, just making sure that I'm sort of centered on the area I care about. Uh, quick OSM. Um, I think it's, is it natural waterway? Otherwise, I'm going to have to look it up. Uh, canvas extent, query. Successful query, but no result. OK. So OSM feature types. I'm Googling here. Yeah, OpenStreetMap Bookie. Feature, I didn't remember all the tags and things. Map features. Can you tell me what they are? I know it's called waterway. Root, waterway. Maybe it's just waterway equals yes. Isn't it? Yeah, waterway. Waterway. Oh, spell that correctly. Query on all values in our canvas extent. Run. All right, now we got some waterways. Some nice natural features here. Um, be interesting to see how that fits all across our hex grid. And again, I'm probably just going to manually assign this to hex edges. But that'll be fun. So if I tab through here, don't need to export that, don't need to export that. I'm going to export my hex grid, though, for important reasons. I'm going to save this and water. I do this all the time, go back and add stuff later. And I'm just going to quickly select everything, and get, get rid of these clipping masks and such. These hexagons are here because they're going to help me line this stuff up with where it was supposed to go on the map. Because, it's like same, fill and stroke, I'm going to need my hexes, because this stuff isn't going to line up and paste in place anymore because I moved my artboard. So it doesn't have an alignment. This, this has a larger artboard than before. Could even use it to rescale things if I needed to. But I'm just going to select my various bits of water that I care about. And I just need the lines. I don't need anything else. Yeah, see? There we go. So now I'm pasting. And you can see, well, it doesn't line up. Uh, it occurs to me that I've forgotten one important thing, though, uh, which is that I don't know which hex to align this to. So I need one more piece of one more thing that I forgot. This is the benefit of live cartography. You see me mess things up just like you do. We all do this. All right, now call it add water. Yep, save that. Good to go. OK, bring it in my uh, lake layer that I had so I have something to align to. Oh, wrong thing. Add water. Good. All right, two hours. This is going to be one of my longest streams ever. And there are still 13 people here, which is less than before, which is very understandable. But that's I, I appreciate you all sticking with me. All right, got those. Got that. Yeah, OK. My bit rate is dropping. It's like it's trying to tell me that I'm taking too long on this live stream. <laughs> All right, hold on a second here. Just going to troubleshoot here. Why has my rate of transmission dropped? Hmm. What did I do that caused it to struggle so? All right, now it says I'm not transmitting any data.
do I even have internet access? I do. Is it picking back up now? Uh, all right, well, I don't know if anybody's getting data anymore from me. I will type in the chat as well, but to, uh, to this. This might be a sign to wrap things up. <laughs> uh, all right, so yeah, just something's struggling with my internet connection. I'll be posting the final map soon on Twitter. Uh, and Pinnacogrifos, and I'm saying out loud everything I'm typing here, just so you, in case the stream actually does pick up and you're listening along. Um, oh yeah, now it says I'm sending, sending some good data. Okay, only a voice. Well, anyway, so thanks so much for being here. Um, you know, this is this was a long runner anyway, and so it's probably good to wrap it up at this stage. Um, sorry for the internet connection issues, though. I just checked, like, I seem to be on the internet. I just, like, tried to open another website, and it was fine. So I'm not sure why the stream is starting to starting to degrade in quality. But if you can still see me, also, just going to give a quick shout-out to everybody who supports me on Patreon. Much appreciated. Um, they help me keep doing stuff like this. Uh, and uh, there's a link in the Patreon description if you want to get involved. There's also, I forgot to mention, a link to the 30-day uh, map challenge in the in the uh, video description. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned that. So if you want to follow up that link to find out more about the challenge, uh, just click on the video description and take you right to Topi's uh, uh, GitHub page. Uh, with that, um, yeah, I'll just finish up. I'll probably look at adding some rivers and maybe a couple labels for that and getting this online, or maybe I won't add them if it doesn't look good. We'll see, but i got to experiment with it. Thanks so much for spending part of your day with me, and uh, I'll catch you all next time. Take care.